Our study this morning is found there in that chapter, chapter 49, and we'll be looking at 39 verses, and we're not going to read all the 39 verses uh, from that chapter. But um, notice the, the title and the theme there is the Most High over all the earth. And that's the theme that we've been seeing over and over and over, especially in these last couple of chapters here in Jeremiah. It shows that the Jewish people are surrounded by their enemies. And five of the enemies are mentioned here. The Ammonites, the Edomites, the Arameans, and their capital city of Damascus, Elamites, and Kedar. Uh, Kedar is like uh, desert dwellers, Bedouin. And they're scattered all over. And so this section takes each of these groups and then talks about God's judgment that's coming upon them. Turn, uh, I know I just asked you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 49, but go now to the book of Psalms. And I want to see something there and then we'll come back. And that's in Psalm 83. So go to Psalm 83. And this is a psalm, a lot of psalms are psalms of David. This is not, David didn't write this psalm. This is somebody named Asaph. And it begins in verse 1. God, do not remain quiet. Do not be silent. And God, do not be still. For behold, your enemies make an uproar. And those who hate you have exalted themselves. They make shrewd plans against your people, conspire together against your treasured ones. They have said, come, let's wipe them out as a nation so that the name of Israel will no longer be remembered. For they have conspired together with one mind. They make a covenant against you. The tents of Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagrites, Gival, Ammon, <coughs> Amalek, Philistia, with the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria also has joined them. They've become a help to the children of Lot. Deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, Yavin, at the river of Kishon, who were destroyed at Endor, who became like dung for the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zev, and all their leaders like Zevah, Zalmunna, who said, Let's possess for ourselves the pastures of God. My God, make them like the whirling dust, like chaff before the wind like fire that burns the forest and like a flame that sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your heavy gale and terrify them with your storm. Fill their faces with dishonor so that they will seek your name, O Lord. May they be, di be ashamed and dismayed forever and may they be humiliated and perish so that they will know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. So that last verse there is the title of what uh, I want us to think about from um, Jeremiah 49. The most high is over all the earth and over all the nations that fill the earth. And Asaph prays this for God to show his strength. And eventually his prayer is answered. And Jeremiah 49 uh, shows us what happened to some of God's enemies. And really the substance here is the same as like in the time of Paul. In Philippians 3, Paul says in verse 18 and 19 that there are many who live as enemies of the cross and their destiny is destruction. And that's always, that's the way that it will be. The enemies of God, the en enemies of the cross, the end result, the destiny is destruction. And so back here in uh, Jeremiah chapter 49, I want to move through quickly each of these groups, and then I want us to see some lessons from this, and uh, really uh, something really surprising in this chapter, I think. But in, cha in chapter 49, verses 1 through 6, it's against the Ammonites, and God promised to destroy them. The Ammonites are uh, Jordanians uh, now. Uh, their capital city is Ammon. And uh, they, like the Moabites, have, their history is not a good history. They were born in incest. Ben-Ami was the son of Lot's daughter after uh, she slept with her fa father. And Genesis 19 tells us about that. Uh, ben means son. Ami, Am means people. So 
the son of my people. That's, the, that's his name. And he is the, from him come the Ammonite people. Like the Moabites, they were then related to the Jewish people. And like the Moabites, they fought constantly with the Jewish people. And that fighting continued in, the, in Jeremiah's day. Baalis, the son of the, or the king of the Ammonites, plotted to assassinate. Uh, you remember the Babylonians came in, they took most of the people into slavery, and they put a governor on the throne. And we saw this earlier in Jeremiah, uh, Gedaliah is his name, back in chapter 40. And the Ammonites were the ones who were behind assassinating him. And this fighting went on for centuries. They had fought uh, against both David and uh, against Saul and David, and both times they were defeated. In uh, the eighth century, they occupied part of the land that belonged to the Israelites that God had given them, the promised land. And uh, while Israel was all fighting the Assyrian king Tiglath Pileser, the greedy Ammonites moved in and just took that, that land. And so Jeremiah says, you look here at verse 1, concerning the sons of Ammon or Ammon, this is what the Lord says. Does Israel have no sons or has he no heirs? Why then has Malcolm taken possession of Gad? That's the, the, referring to the God of the Ammonites. Why has he taken possession of Gad and his people settled in his cities? And so it mentions Malcolm, and sometimes the text will have Molech, but Molech is the God of the Ammonites, really one of the most vile pagan gods in the ancient Near East. Molech worship required child sacrifice. We don't know exactly what was involved in that. Some have even suggested that there was an image of Moloch, a metal image of Moloch, and they would heat that up just red hot and then place the children in the arms of that. And that's just, uh, it's just revolting to us. It's very terrible. And it shows the sign of Israel's depravity that Jeremiah had to preach against Moloch worshipers in Jerusalem. That's back in chapter 32. Uh, and God says, they're offering their children to Moloch. I never commanded that. It didn't even enter my mind. Now, why are they doing that? So they're worshiping this terrible God, Moloch, and they tried to destroy Israel through military and, and even by spiritually trying to destroy their, their faith. Now, God says, look at verses 2 and 3 here. Even your God's going to be taken into exile. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, verse 2 declares the Lord, when I will cause an alarm of war to be heard against Rabbah of the sons of Ammon. And it will become a desolate heap, and her towns will be set on fire. Then Israel will take possession of her possessors, says the Lord. Well, Heshbon, for I has been destroyed. Cry out, daughters of Rabbah. Put on sackcloth and mourn and move out about inside the walls for Malcolm or Molech will go into exile together with his priest and his leaders. So your idol God is going into slavery as well. Everybody will be driven away, he says. And that was fulfilled. Sometime after the Ammonites joined a international coalition to fight against Babylon. And we read about this in chapter 27 of Jeremiah. Nebuchadnezzar led his armies in and conquered the Ammonites. So in this chapter, God says, I'm bringing judgment against the Ammonites. Secondly, in verses 7 through 22, it's against the Edomites. And the Edomites are also related to the Jewish people. Uh, their ancestry goes back to Esau. Another name for Esau is uh, Edom or Edom. The, the Hebrew word for blood is Dom, D-A-M. And it can also have the idea of something that's red. And so Edom or Edom is red and it's also related to the, to the ground, Adama, which is like red. And so Esau, another name for Esau is, uh, is Edom or uh, Edom. And so Esau, of course, is the brother of Jacob, and there's sibling rivalry there, you know, through the, the centuries. And the Edomites are constantly opposing the Israelites. When Israel left Egypt and they're going to the Promised Land, 
the Edomites refused to let Moses and the children of Israel pass through their land. Even when Moses says, we'll not, we'll not take anything, we won't harm anything, we're just passing through. And they wouldn't do that. Um, in the time of David, David became famous because it says in uh, 2 Samuel 8 that he struck down 18,000 Edomites in the valley of salt. That's around the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea. And they tried to, the Edomites tried to get revenge on the Israelites during the time of Solomon. And Jer when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians, all the Edomites rejoiced. Psalm 137 tells us that. Now, Jeremiah prophesied, after all that hostility, Edom is going to be destroyed. Skip down here to verse 8 of Jeremiah 49. Flee away, turn back, dwell in the depths, you inhabitants of Dedan. For I will bring the disaster of Esau upon him at the time I punish him. And look at verses 12 and 13. This is what the Lord says. Behold, those who were not sentenced to drink the cup will certainly drink it. So are you the one who will be completely held completely blameless? You'll not be blameless. You'll certainly drink it. For I have sworn by myself that this, he talks about the land, Bozrah, will be an object of horror, disgrace, a wasteland, a curse, and all its cities a permanent ruin. And that happened. We're not certain exactly when that happened. Most likely the Babylonians did that when um, they came into the land because the Edomites were part of a coalition against the Babylonians. And uh, Babylon is compared to an eagle, and it's like an eagle swooping down and taking them away. Look at verse 22. It says, uh, Behold, he will mount up and swoop like an eagle, or an eagle, and spread out his wings against Bozrah. And the hearts of the warriors of Edom or Edom on that day will be like the heart of a woman in labor. So God will bring judgment against the Edomites. Then a third nation um, is in verse 23 through 27, and it's against the Syrians. The, all these are different names. Damascus is their, their capital city. But they're Syria, not Assyria, but the Syrians are the Arameans. And they were known in those days as very fierce enemies of the Jewish people. In the time of Elijah, gangs of Arameans came into Israel and they would plunder. Uh, like the Ammonites, like the Edomites, the Arameans are going to suffer as well. Look at verse 23. Concerning Damascus, Kamat or Fad are put to shame. They've heard bad news. They despair. There's anxiety at the sea. It cannot be calmed. Damascus has become helpless. She's turned away to flee and panic has gripped her. Distress and labor pains have seized her like a woman in childbirth. And again, <clears throat> we don't know exactly. It's difficult to know exactly when that was fulfilled, but uh, it's known that Damascus became a vassal to uh, Babylon in 605. So we've seen three nations and the same thing continues in this chapter. Look at verse 28 through 33. The fourth kingdom and uh, in verse 28 is he says concerning Kedar and the kingdoms of Katsor. And that's talking about these Bedouin, the shepherds in the Middle East and they wandered and they lived in tents. And since they're nomads, they thought, well, we can move around. We can move around quickly. They, they often escape military conflict with the Babylonians because they're constantly moving around and they're in the desert. Uh, but not this time. God can bring their destruction upon them. Look at verse 28, the latter part. Arise, go up to Kedar, devastate the people of the east. They will take away their tents and their flocks. They'll carry all for themselves, their tent curtains, all their goods, their camels. And they will call out to one another horror on every side. They'll plunder them, it says. And it talks about Kotsor in verse 32 and 33 will become a place of jackals, a desolate place. Nobody will dwell there. So even in the desert, if you think, okay, well, we're, we're safe, we can just kind of move around. Uh, their enemies would find them. And God is behind that. Uh, 29 and 30, he says, uh, 
they'll take away the tents, the flocks, you run, and then verse 30, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has formed a plan against you, and devised a scheme against you. And there are Babylonian records that uh, Kedar and Kotsor were attacked and they were defeated in the year 599. They tried to cut off supply lines to the Babylonians and so Nebuchadnezzar just sent his soldiers in there to take care of them. Finally, the last group of people in Jeremiah 49 are the Elamites. And that's found in verse 34 through 39. And just like all the other nations, they're destined for destruction. Look at verse 36. I'll bring upon Elam the four winds from the four ends of heaven, and I'll scatter them to all the winds. There will be no nation to which the outcast of Elam will not go. I'll shatter Elam before his enemies. Even my fierce anger declares this. I will send a sword after them. The Elamites lived far from uh, Israel, and uh, they were the Persians. They lived in what is now uh, known as southern Iran. And so they're far away, but they didn't live outside the sovereignty of God. They didn't live outside the judgment of God. And again, we don't know for sure when their judgment came, but uh, their Babylonian records, uh, 596 talks about the Babylonians fighting them. <coughs> Now, what does all this mean? Well, it's pretty simple as we read this. It's pretty simple for Jeremiah's, any of his readers to see this, that God will, it's certain, God will defeat all of his enemies. Jeremiah collected years of prophecies at the end of his book here in this oracle of the nations or against the nations. And it's showing, just like we saw from the psalmist there in Psalm 83, that God is the most high over all the earth. And he's still the most high over all the earth. And this should bring encouragement to us when world events are troubled. And they are troubled today. God's justice will always remain. One day, the nations that attack their neighbors, that rule by terror, that don't care anything about justice, that traffic in, in drugs, that hire assassins, promote abortion, destroy what God has created, stockpile weapons, will be brought to account for their sins. And that might include, of course, our own nation. All nations are under God's sovereignty. And it's just, it's right for God to destroy His enemies. They're not just the enemies of God's people, they're the enemies of God. My king that allows himself to be mocked <clears throat> loses all respect. God is the king, and he will not allow himself to be mocked forever. A true king defends himself. I mean, a, a, a king couldn't allow evil men just to come in and take over the whole land and enslave his people and insult his royal dignity. God will not allow that. Now, it might appear that evil is victorious in our world, but one day God will vanquish all of his enemies. He is the true king. I mean, throughout this, you have, I'll do this, I'll do this. Like in uh, verse 2, I'll sound the battle cry. Verse 10, I'll strip Esau bare. Verse 27, I'll set fire to the walls of Damascus. I'll set my throne in the law. Who's the I? It's God. God will defeat all his enemies. And there's a striking picture here in this, in this section uh, of God defeating his enemies. And it's found in verse 19 through 21 when he's talking about or against uh, Edom. Look at verse 19 again. It says um, to Edom, Behold, one will come up like a lion from the thicket of the Jordan to a perennially watered pasture. For in an instant I'll chase him away from it and I will appoint over it whoever is chosen who is like me who will summon me into court who then is the shepherd who can stand against me that's a striking picture it's a picture of God as a lion and he is a, a roaring lion a destroying lion like a lion who will come up uh, several Hebrew scholars have examined God as a lion. In fact, one person wrote a book based on their 
uh, PhD dissertation. It's 600 pages long. God as a lion in the Hebrew Scriptures. And especially in the Minor Prophets, God is described as a lion about 23 times. And there's a, there's a large lion vocabulary in the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, sometimes uh, he's a young lion, pictures young lion, an older lion, all these words for lion, but God is a lion. And imagine, you know, it's still out in the desert and then you hear a lion roar. Amos, for instance, says the Lord has roared. That just it brings fear to your, to your heart. In the, in the book of Hosea, Hosea, God is pictured as a lion three times. Two of those times are judgment. He said, I'll come, in my peop come, come to my people in judgment, like a lion. One is in salvation. He says, like a lion, I'm going to destroy your enemies. So it's a really, I think, a very vivid picture of the strength, the power of God as a lion destroying. Yet, I don't think it's an accident that the lamb of God is pictured as a lion from the tribe of Judah. And so that great strength works for God's people and saves God's people. Several of those scholars, one scholar had this quote. He said, there are no bars that can keep this lion at a safe viewing distance. He's still a lion. That means we respect him. And then uh, the other one, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And it has, I think, some veiled references to God and to Christ. But there is a lion in that book, and you probably know this, and his name is Aslan. And Susan, uh, this little girl, asked uh, someone, who is Aslan? And he said, you don't know who Aslan is? And he says, Aslan is a lion. And she said, uh, should I be terrified? And he said, well, you should be terrified. But the answer, and Aslan seems to be a veiled reference to Christ. But his answer is, when she says, who is Aslan? He said, he is, the answer is, he is not safe, but he is good. He is good. God is not safe, but he is good. And his power works toward his people to deliver them, but toward his enemies that we've been seeing here, he will destroy. Now that question, look at verse 19 again. He says, who is like me? Who will summon me into court? And who then is the shepherd who can stand against me? And that question is also asked in Isaiah 63 in, in verse 1. So the question is, who, who is the chosen one? Who is the lion? Who is the king who will defeat God's enemies? Isaiah says, who is this coming from Edom, from Bozrah, with his garment stained crimson? Who is this robed in splendor? riding forward in greatness of his strength. And unlike Jeremiah, the prophet Isaiah is given the answer. In Isaiah 63, verse 1, it, the warrior speaks and says, It is I speaking in righteousness mighty to save. In other words, the one coming is God himself. And his garments, and echo, it's echoed in Revelation, you know, tra when he's trampling out the vineyard of God's wrath, and it's just splatters all over his garment. That's the same picture here in Isaiah. And so God says, I'll defeat my enemies. And that's also a picture of the final judgment. So the victory of Christ is good news to his people. But the victory of Christ is bad news to those who oppose God. And so the, the big question is, are we a friend of God or are we an enemy of God? Now, I want to look, uh, we just have a few minutes, but I want to look uh, in this chapter 49. All these nations are judged because they're enemies of God. They don't trust in God. And this text gives us some things that they trusted in instead of God. For instance, in verse 4, the Ammonites trusted in their wealth. You boast about your valleys. You trust in your treasures. Who can come against me? Because I have all this wealth. They didn't think anybody could touch them because they lived in these lush valleys and they have all this wealth. So they trust in their wealth. Their wealth didn't save them in God's wrath. The Edomites, in verse 7 and also verse 16, trusted in their wisdom. They were known, it seems, for their wisdom. So verse 7, 
concerning Edom, this is what the Lord of Armies says. Is there no longer any wisdom in Taman? Has good advice been lost by the prudent? Has their wisdom decayed? In other words, is your wisdom, why can't your wisdom save you now? It can't save you. They also trusted in their defenses. In verse 16, it talks about they live in the cliffs of the rock. The Syrians trusted in their fame. Verse 25, this city was a city of renown. The desert dwellers, Kedar and Katsor, trusted in themselves. They're carefree and so they have their they independent and they thought, well, we can save ourselves. The Elamites trusted in their weapons. It talks about the bow of the Elamites. All these things couldn't protect them from the wrath of God. Now, Jeremiah is history, but it's not mere history. And all these people trust in their wealth, their wisdom, their weapons, and the same way people trust basically the same things today. Money, intelligence, independence, power, military. None of that can hold off God's wrath. And we might think God's judgment will not strike us. All these nations, these are powerful nations. And yet, God said, I'll bring their downfall. Now, back in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, it says, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. He says, Let him boast that he knows me. And that's a powerful message for us. These nations stand as examples. Don't trust in ourselves, our strength, our riches, whatever we have. Trust in God. Now this section, chapter, is mainly about God's wrath against his enemies. Yet there are words of grace. And this is the surprising thing that I wanted to uh, talk about. Um, in verse, uh, verses 10 and 11... I've stripped Esau bare. I've uncovered his hiding places. He'll not be able to conceal himself. But then verse 11 he says, Leave your orphans behind and I will keep them alive. Let your widows trust in me. So God said, I'll protect your helpless people, but I'm not protecting you. My wrath is against you. So God has always throughout Scripture protected and shown grace to the helpless, the widows, the orphans. Look at verse 6. This is a whole nation. He says, Afterward I will restore the fortunes of the son, sons of Ammon, declares the Lord. Same thing at the end of the chapter, verse 39. But I will come, it will come about in the last days. I will restore the fortunes of Elam, declares the Lord. What does it mean to restore the fortunes? It may mean God will bless that nation again. God destroyed many of these ancient uh, people, but uh, Elam became, a, uh, became the center of the Persian Empire. I'll restore the fortunes. Uh, we think about the Elamites. There is another passage, and this is in the New Testament, and the book of Acts in chapter 2, Luke describes the day of Pentecost. And uh, he talks about how the, the apostles were all together in, in the one place in the upper room. And suddenly there came a sound, a noise, filled the whole place where they were sitting like a mighty rushing wind. And there were tongues like fire that sat upon each of them. That's the apostles. They began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then Luke tells us that there were people there listening the day of Pentecost. And in Acts 2, uh, verses 4 through 9, these people said, how are, all, how are we hearing the, the, them speak in our own language? And then we have a list. Listen, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites. So we have Elamites there on the day of Pentecost who hear the good news of the gospel from Peter and the other apostles. So there's wor there these words of grace from God to these enemies if they'll turn to Him. And we find that throughout Scripture. And the only hope eventually is turning to God through Messiah, through Christ.
Uh, and we're going to sing an invitation song, number 740, What Will You Do With Jesus? And that's a good question because that will depend on whether we are a friend of God or an enemy of God. God will destroy His enemies, as we've seen. Yet there is salvation in Christ. God, out of mercy and grace, offers that salvation. But it's only to the ones who trust in Christ for that salvation. Not, not in wealth, not in power, not in knowledge or intelligence. Trusting in Christ as Savior. He died for our sins. He took our place. And so the Bible calls everyone to turn to Him in living faith. Confess His name. Be baptized. Be immersed. Die to sin. You're buried. You're raised up to walk a new life. That's good news. And that's the hope that we have. Otherwise, the other picture is God in His wrath like a lion destroying His enemies. It's our prayer. If you need to come this morning, you'll do that while we stand, while we sing.